Greenbrook Fellowship, Baytown's First Baptist Church. If you will allow me, I'm going to tell you about some exciting things that are going on this week. Tonight, 6 p.m., they're having an Easter concert. Be there. This Wednesday is our meal, a uh, family meal. It's $5 per person, $20 max for the family. It's, it's delicious. And there's dessert. Don't miss it. Friday, our Good Friday service will be at 5 p.m. And then Sunday will be three services, uh, sunrise at 7, 9.30, and 11. Hosanna, Hosanna. Our king is victorious. Welcome in. We've got the theme for Palm Sunday. Um, yesterday was our first game of Upward. Um, woo, woo, woo. Um, there was a gentleman in his 30s, and um, he wanted to play with the chalk. I was like, hey, if you can get down there and get back up again, go for it. He draws a whale which you know what that means. He wants to talk about Jesus. So I invited him to Easter, okay? But he had this look, and I said, hey, do you know what Easter's about? And he looked at me, he's like, no. So I got to tell him about the resurrection, okay? A believer believes, but a disciple of Jesus follows, okay? Invite people to our Easter service, but ask them if they know about the resurrection. Do they know about this? Jesus rode in on a donkey, and the same people who said, Hosanna, Hosanna, the very next week said, crucify, crucify. All right? The same Jesus that came in on a donkey, he's coming back. We better get ready. All right? Father God, Lord, we just thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for the place that we can learn about you, Lord. Help us to open up uh, conversations about you, Lord. Um, and for us to prepare the people that you put before us to just tell them about what you did for us on the cross. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, amen. It is Palm Sunday. It's good to see you today. Welcome to Rolling Brook Fellowship. Go ahead and stand with us if you are able to. We're going to read this scripture out of Zechariah 9 together. Read it with me. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey riding on a donkey's colt. Sound familiar to you? This is actually an Old Testament prophecy. And Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. We find it in Matthew 21. We find it in the three other gospels, or yeah, the three other gospels as well. And um, we celebrate that today. We recognize that today. Just as Jesus came in riding on a donkey, uh, we recognize that with these, these clothes here on stage, the, the palm branches, it says that they were waving palm branches. They laid down their outer garments uh, for him to, to tread on, kind of making a path. And they were shouting the word Hosanna, which uh, translates to glory in the highest is a Hebrew word. Okay, so we're going to start our service off this morning by singing a song called Shout Hosanna. We need your help, though. We need you to be loud. We need you to shout Hosanna this morning. We're going to fill this place with praise, all right? You think we can do that today? Come on, let's do it together.
same power that rolled that stone away is the same power that lives in us. We are filled with that Holy Spirit. We sing that together.
washed away, washed away, Jose.
voices. So at this time, I want to invite you, speaking of altar, the altar is open. So if you want to come down and pray, uh, come down now. Um, don't wait. Don't delay. Respond. If the Lord is drawing you to, to take some money that you're friends with or a family member, come down and pray with your family at this time, your friends, whatever the, whatever may be. We're going to continue with our song worship, but don't, don't miss out on this opportunity to come pray at the altar before the Lord. Yeah. 
is worthy of our praise. Amen. You are worthy, Lord. Thank you for just who you are, perfect in every way, spotless, blameless. We thank you that, that you chose in all your glory and honor to come down and, and, and be wrapped in humanity, Lord, and, and, and take the penalty for what we deserve, Lord. Thank you that you are worthy. And Lord, today as we continue this service, may we be, be about giving you and bringing you glory, Father, by focusing in on the message today and just listening with our hearts, Lord, and our minds. And Lord, I just pray that, that we would leave today um, different and changed and, and filled so that we might go and, and share the love of Christ to someone else. May we invite people to church. I feel like that's just something that doesn't happen all that often today. May we fill this place up next week Lost with lost people who don't know you, so that the gospel message would be heard and people would be saved, lives would be changed. Lord, you are due all the honor and glory, and we give that to you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. And have a seat at this time. I was actually here, I just, it was one of those moments where I was hurrying and uh, I had to get my tape for this piece and I'm just, just come on, you know. Any other time I would have got it like that with uh, the pressure of it. So good. We were having a great time in children's worship. We're talking about the crucifixion and your kids were just amazing. They were on the edge of their seats and we uh, tempered it a little bit, but they were uh, just really, really listening and um, asking some really good questions and just a beautiful thing. So uh, really glad that you're here today. And uh, for those visiting, I hope you filled out a visitor's card. And we would love to have you be a part of Rolling Brook Fellowship. And after the service, I'll be down front and you can join. Or if you would like just to need prayer, I would be honored to, to pray with you. Uh, it would be a joy to have you there, uh, have you part of our fellowship. Sorry about that. Didn't quite get the tape. <laughs> All right. So I do hope you come back tonight for the choir presentation at 6 and then stay for the fellowship. Come for the music, uh, stay for the fellowship and be part of the church family and get to know one another. And we hope to see you Friday at 5 o'clock for our Good Friday service. That service is designed, it's a very brief service, it's 20 minutes. Uh, and then the idea is that you go out with your family or friends and enjoy a time of fellowship with one another and, and just uh, the, the, what the blessing of, of family and friends. So at this time, I'm going to invite you to stand and say grace and peace to one another uh, as we prepare for this message.
All righty, thank you. You can return and remain standing for the reading of God's word. And if you did not pick up the notes, I would recommend getting some notes. I think you will uh, be glad you got them uh, today. And uh, they're in the back. And if you need to go leave and get some, uh, by all means, do that. You're not going to bother me at all. And so what we have today, we're going to be reading out just one verse. And it's from the uh, book of 1 John 4.10. And I'm going to ask you to read this with me. So if you notes, you're going to see it. And if you have your Bibles, you can, there's one in the pew back too. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. We're going to read it together out loud. And if you have a different version, if I stumble, whatever, just keep going. We're going to read this together. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. So would you read this with me? This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Will you pray with me? Father, uh, thank you so much for this day and this time of year where we can pause and just remember what really counts and, and value it and uh, treasure it uh, and live it out. Father, I pray that you would join us, be glorified. God, we say thank you for the work of your son and what he did. Father, uh, for the kiddos, be with them now as they are uh, in their own setting and just be present with them and be glorified by their worship and the Bible studies going on. Father, I pray that you would be there as well. Father, we love you. Uh, hide me behind the cross. I pray that what is said is honoring to you. Speak to our hearts and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. You can be re uh, seated. Uh, there's a picture on your, on your notes uh, if, in case you haven't seen it and uh, it may be familiar to you in case you don't know. It's a, the, the, the Starry Night. It's not Starry Night. The Starry Night uh, by Vincent van Gogh. Uh, I was looking online uh, this week about how much if I wanted to go out and buy the the Starry Night, it would cost me about a million dollars. Uh, but there are other paintings worth much, much more. I, I was looking at the highest number and it was like 450 million. And I'm like, goodness gracious, if I had the money, I don't know if I would buy it because, you know, I mean, what would you do with this painting, right? What would you, my grandsons are in town and they drew pictures for us yesterday. And they're much more valuable than this thing, okay? It's because I know the, art, the artist. I have a relationship with them. And I know their heart and experience them. And so I value what they do so, so, so much more. And in the same way, how do you look at the cross? How do you see the cross? How do you interpret it? How do you value it? Do you value it? Some say the cross is a myth. The whole story is a myth. His crucifixion was just made up. But we know this, that there are... Um, uh, uh, historians outside the Bible, extra biblical uh, resources that tell us that Jesus was real. A guy by the name of Josephus, we'll t mention him later on. Uh, some say it's a tragic story. A man dies on a cross, but it really has nothing to do with me. You know, no, nothing about sin, nothing about that, no, nothing about atonement. Yet some say the crucifixion of Jesus was payment for my sin so that I can be forgiven and be made right with God. And the real question, of course, is why did Jesus die? And this morning, I think it would be appropriate as we begin uh, what is referred to in church history as Holy Week, that we talk about uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So we'll get back to 1 Peter in a couple of weeks. We're talking about the, the crucifixion today. And then um, uh, next, Wednesday, uh, next Sunday is um, Easter and invite you back for that. In the Christian world, in the Christian calendar, uh, how they view things, this is good. Uh, this is Palm Sunday. Monday is considered Holy Monday. That's the day that uh, church history tells, that church history says, again, this is extra biblical. These things happen, but they're not sure of the days they happen. But Holy Monday is the day that uh, Jesus cleansed the temple, um, cleared the people out because of the money changing that was going on. Tuesday, Holy Tuesday, is the day that the church history says that Jesus taught on like marriage, taught on the question, you know, what do we give Caesar? What about taxes? And Jesus answered that and does what is called, or speaks about the seven woes. Wednesday is called Spy Wednesday. Spy Wednesday is the day that church history says that Judas went and met with the religious leaders and made the deal for 30 pieces of silver. And then we have Monday, Thursday, which is the Last Supper, and Jesus is called to serve. And then Friday is the death of Jesus, Good Friday. And then Saturday is the day of mourning. And then Sunday, of course, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now today what we're going to do, we're going to pick up in the Gospel of Matthew with events on Friday. He has been arrested by guards of the Jewish 
temple. So these are guards, not the Roman guards yet. You'll, we're going to hear them. These are guards uh, that worked in the Jewish temple, and they were ordered to, be, uh, to arrest Jesus by the high priest. And while under arrest, Luke tells us uh, that these guards mocked Jesus and beat Jesus. And then he appeared before the Jewish high council. And they would accuse Jesus of blasphemy and lying, and they sent him to Pilate. And Pilate, what scripture says, it's really fascinating. Pilate's such a tragic character, I think, or maybe not, I don't know. But it seems like Pilate wanted to kind of get away from, like he didn't think Jesus was guilty. Kind of just, I really don't want to be involved in this. Trying to kind of pass the buck. And so what Pilate does, he asks Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus answers him, yeah, my kingdom is not of this world. You would have no authority over me if it weren't given to you from above. Pilate didn't see Jesus as much of a threat, sends him to Herod. Herod sends him back to Pilate. Pilate says, I really don't know what to do with him. There's a, a fascinating moment in uh, Matthew's gospel where Pilate's wife goes to him. You can just see this, just, a, just such intrigue. He's, Man, I wish I knew more about this. But Pilate's wife goes to Pilate and says, sweetheart, <laughs> this guy's innocent. Don't have anything to do with him. Uh, and so Pilate's getting pressure from these priests, from his wife, right? And they have influence. You know, the spouse always has influence. And then the people. And so all these pressures are coming in on Pilate. And he gives the people the choice. Who do you want to release, Barabbas or uh, Jesus? We know from the Luke's gospel that Barabbas had been accused of um, insurrection, a rebel against the Roman Empire. And he was accused of murder. And the people said, let's have Barabbas freed and not Jesus. And so let's look at Matthew 27, 24, chapter 27, starting in verse 24. We're going to cover a lot of territory. You're going to try to go quick. Uh, I, and I just want you to understand what Jesus went through to maybe help us navigate this week and walk humbly and joyfully at what he did. So in verse 24, it goes like this. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water, washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and all our children. Then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. So Pilate says, I'm, I'm washing my hands. You guys want him killed? That's your business. And so you, when you look at Pilate, just read all the gospels and, and just see what happens with Pilate. Fascinating narrative in his life. Probably just a try, he couldn't make a hard decision when it counted. And so Pilate actually seemed to want to release Jesus. Now, the Roman scourging was called a flagrum or a flagellum, either way, the whipping device. And it was a short whip. So you had a handle about this big for the hand to grip, and it had a nice wooden grip, probably leather around it. And the actual whips themselves were anywhere from 24 inches to 30 inches. So it's not a very long whip. And intertwined in this all these little thongs that came out of the whip, all these leather straps, they would tie into them pieces of glass, pieces of, of metal, uh, and bones of dead animals. Oftentimes they would use sheep bones. And if they wanted someone to really suffer, they would dip the bones and the metal into uh, an anim animal blood. And so then strike the person, and of course infection would uh, gain hold, and the person would die they did not use a long whip. We have this idea that Jesus was whipped with this massive long whip and, you know, kind of a uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark type thing. But they didn't do that. They needed control. They wanted to control so they could control the suffering. They had it down to a science. And the person would be strapped. And there's some debate on the strap. And you know, I'm going to mention that some say this, some say that. And a lot of times it really doesn't matter. Like in this case, they would strap him. Some said they would lean him over and strap him. The bottom line, they were very tightly strapped so they couldn't wiggle. So that the person doing the whipping, and there were normally two people that would do the scourging. They would be taking turns with these short whips, if you will. Um, they had the person and he couldn't move. 
They couldn't move, so he couldn't wiggle out. They could have clear aim. They could take care of business. They knew where the first one went, the second one went, the fifth one hit, the sixth one, the 20th one, all of those. They had this thing down to a science, and the idea was to make the man uh, uh, absolutely suffer in this setting. The longer the whip, they couldn't control it, and so they could, the person could die, honestly, before they wanted him to. And it's, it's kind of the, the morbidity of this, just the grossness of the Roman idea and the way of thinking. They didn't want that quick death. And so my point is the Romans had perfected this punishment, and it's this punishment that Jesus experiences. And there were three degrees of scourging, three degrees of scourging. It depended on the crime. So not everyone got the same scourging. There were the two lesser offenses or lesser punishments that left victims alive but scarred for the rest of their life. And that person became a walking billboard. Don't mess with the Romans or this will happen to you. Jesus didn't get that. He got the maximum scourging available. Or, uh, and some say it was 39 lashes. Some say it was 40 lashes. The Bible doesn't say how many lashes Jesus got. Jewish law said that you could only give up to 39. But Jesus wasn't being scourged by the Jews. He was being scourged by the Romans. And Roman law said, you just scourge to your heart content. You control the setting. You just make the person suffer. So Jesus could have been scourged 41, 52, 60 times. We're not really sure on that. At the end of this whip, and people often refer to it as a cat of nine tails, and that's really not accurate. That phrase uh, came into existence in the 1800s with the British flogging of naval members that were in rebellion or mutiny. At the end of this whip, at the end of the, each um, leather strap would be a hook. Okay. And think of a fishing hook. How many fishermen do we have in here? Anybody ever, let me ask this question. Anybody ever been caught by a fishing hook? Okay. You know, they're not the easiest things to get out. They're designed not to come out. You know, you have the that big hook, but then you have, and I don't know what it's called, but you have that little whoop right back at you, right? And so, that, you know, that fish gets it, and that's not coming out. That's what they had on the end of their whips. These larger, these kind of large, and there's a picture of one on your notes. You see how that, and it's, that was called the scorpion. And so they would hit the person, boom, the hook goes in, and they pull it out. And the person's body just becomes shredded, 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 worse and worse. And they had the targets. A couple of um, uh, eyewitnesses. This is Eusebius of Caesarea. He's a uh, historian from the 300s. He, this is how he, write, he writes about it. He says, the bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw the laceration with scourges even to the innermost veins and arteries so that the hidden inward parts of the body both their bowels and their members were exposed to view. And so organs could, would become exposed. We didn't talk about this in children's worship, okay? Let me just, say, let me just relieve you of that, mom and dad. There's a famous article from uh, years back uh, from the American Medical Association, a guy by the name of William Edwards. He's a doctor and he describes scourging and what it does uh, from a medical perspective. He said the leather thongs and sheep bones would cut into the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, I had to look that up, that's parts under the skin. Then as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into, think of those fish hooks, the underlying skeletal muscles produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. So it would just kind of peel back the flesh that was going on. And then another guy writes, uh, the bits of metal would dig deep into the flesh, ripping small blood vessels, nerves, muscles, and skin, resulting in lacerations, puncture marks, uh, and the scorpion lacerations would dig into the chest cavity so they would whip, go around, and then pull this way, and the person was in absolute pain and suffering. Several of the eyewitness accounts talked about the worst, the worst whip moment, if I could say it that way. I mean, how bad would they all be was the first one. And that those evil men, wicked men, rebels, murderers like Barabbas, right? Bad dudes 
would be locked up and they would just be quivering and weeping, be waiting for that first whip. And they would intentionally just kind of hold, go into a holding pattern, letting that guy just sit there waiting, waiting, waiting before that first one came down on him. What's interesting is Isaiah 52, 14 actually prophesies this. So you have this incredible whipping and this is, should speak to all of us. 700 years before this, this is what the prophet Isaiah said. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. Okay? So the prophet Isaiah said, the coming son of God, the coming Messiah, is gonna be in, he's gonna become disfigured. His appearance will be absolutely appalling to those who see it. Isaiah went on to say in 53, 5, by his stripes or by his wounds we are healed. And that word in the Hebrew is haburah, haburah, and it means stripes. And every one of those stripes that Jesus took, every whip was for our healing. Verse 27 says this, then the soldiers uh, of the government took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, hail, king of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on his head. So this, they, would take, they took Jesus to the headquarters of the governor in the Greek, it's called the Praetorium. And it was an area that housed about 600 men. It was kind of the embassy, if you will, of Rome. And this is kind of the elite guards that protected Pilate. And so these elite guards continued the psychological and physical torture of Jesus. So he's been tortured by the temple guards. Now he's being tortured. He's been uh, uh, flogged. And now he's being tortured by the Roman guards. He's stripped. They place a crown of thorn on his head. These are thorns that would be about two inches uh, long, two, two and a half inches long. They mocked him, spit on him, struck him on the head. And notice they kneel. And they call him, they say, hail, king of the Jews. And so what are they doing? They're humiliating him. They're making fun of him. They're like the bullies on the playground, right? These are the bullies on the playground. Little do these men know that Jesus is the king of the Jews. That's the irony in all of this. He is the king of the Jews of all of us. Little do these men know that someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Little do these men know that they are helping fulfill prophecy in Matthew 20. This is what Jesus said. He's talking to his disciples, says, fellas, I'm going to Jerusalem and it's going to get ugly. And this is what he says. See, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priest. Check. And the scribes. Check. And they will condemn him to death. Check. They will deliver him over to the Gentiles. That would be the Romans. Check. To be mocked and flogged. Check, check. And crucified. Will happen. And he will be raised on the third day. Jesus knew that this was all going to happen. And Isaiah foretold it 700 years earlier. This is Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. I offered my back to those who beat me. I offered my back, gave it willingly. My cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. That is what our Lord was going through for you and for me. Verse 31. And when he had been mocked, they stripped him of the robe. They put his clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. And they compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross or his cross. And so Jesus begins the journey to Golgotha, which is a small hill in Jerusalem proper. And he would have traveled down the street and the Roman soldiers would have been in front, side, maybe behind as well. So you're looking at the, these prisoners being paraded down the streets. And the people of Jerusalem were encouraged or expected to mock the criminals. So imagine these people lining the sides and they're just spitting, they're abusing Jesus, they're mocking him. There's probably some people with some compassion for him. But these, it's just a, a way to humiliate these criminals even more. Oftentimes they would have a sign around their neck saying their crime or someone would walk in front of them carrying the sign with the accusation, king of the Jews. That would be the sign that would be placed on the cross. Notice Jesus is carrying his cross. And there's a lot of debate on this. Some say it was a cross beam, some commentary, some say it was the whole cross. And so you, if you say, well, it doesn't really matter, I would agree, but... The cross beam may have weighed 40 pounds. The whole cross, you're looking at somewhere 250 pounds. And so how much weight was Jesus carrying? 
We don't know. Whatever it was, he had been so weakened by the flogging that he couldn't carry it, whatever the weight was. He struggled. And this is where curiosity becomes destiny. There is Simon. He's from Libya, present-day Libya, and he happens to be there for the Passover. And this is so cool, guys. This is so cool. He's there watching, probably just curious, seeing what's going on. Maybe he's heard about Jesus. And they carry the cross the rest of the way. And it's just amazing to me that Simon happened to be there, right? It just so happened. Now, stay with me on this. I'm going to ask you to move very quickly. Anytime you see a name in the Bible, you should, it should say, okay, something's up with this guy. That's how they kind of talk to each other in the first century. It's like or you, the, how you validate it. Hey, I was talking uh, with uh, Dallas Garrett the other day. And so, oh, I can go talk to Dallas and confirm this, okay? So when a name popped up, it was a big deal. Hang with me. Turn in Mark 15, 21. If you have your Bibles, turn in there. I'm going to move very quickly here. And Mark tells us a little bit more, okay? This is what Mark says. Listen to what he says. He describes the situation. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon... Okay, now we get a little more information. You ready? The father of Alexander and Rufus, so Simon had two boys, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. So just passing by in Jerusalem for the Passover, and boom, he is asked to carry the cross of Jesus. And he has two boys, Alexander and Rufus. Now flip over to Romans 15, 13, or excuse me, 16, 13, and I'm going to read it to you. Paul is writing the Romans, and he says this. He's listing a bunch of names. Greet Rufus for me, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who's been a mother to me too. So Rufus' mom was very nice to Paul, very good, treated him really well. And what Biblical scholars believe that Simon, who carried the cross, his two boys, Rufus and Alexander, were there with him, probably his wife as well, for the Passover. They became followers of Jesus Christ. If you went to the Passover, oftentimes the Jewish people would stay all the way. I mean, a long vacay all the way to Pentecost. And that first sermon by Peter says Jesus is the way Jesus is the truth he's the only way to God and 3,000 were saved it's possible that Rufus Alexander and Simon and his wife all became followers of Jesus Christ and now you got Rufus in the Roman church and Peter or, or, or Paul says say hi to Rufus for me and that is just amazing to me you know again I they could ask him about this very moment maybe during the meet and greet or at the donut, or for the donut donutorium as they would have in Rome, uh, you know, they could go to Rufus. Was the death, did your father really carry that cross? Yeah. Really? What was it like? You were there. What happened? And he could say, my dad carried his cross, and we can't carry the cross like Rufus's dad Simon, but let me ask the dads in this room and to all the parents, how are you showing or impacting your children and what you do for Jesus? Will they remember? So let me challenge you to cowboy up and let me give you eight words. He died for you, you live for him. Verse 33, and when they came to the place called Golgotha, parenthetically, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them casting lot, by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, king of the Jews, which was true. He is king. So Jesus has had no sleep. He's been beaten, humiliated, scourged. Now comes the actual crucifixion. And you probably know this. Crucifixion was designed to be a long, painful death. Criminals, criminals could last hours on the cross or days but you think about what Jesus has been through this is a guy that's had no sleep nothing to eat he's been beaten he's been flogged he's been that scourging has taken place he is absolutely exhausted he's out there on the cross and the elements 
We don't know the weather conditions, but that's what he's thinking of the bugs that would, I just, you know, for me in my little shallow mind, I think of flies, just how annoying I, annoyed I get with a fly. <laughs> I can't even, that's how small I am, but this is Jesus stripped naked, incredible pain from the flogging. And what we fail to remember and is in a crucifixion or fail to realize, in the crucifixion it was designed to dislocate shoulders and elbows. And so you're like this, but you, you collapse down and you really have no way. It's very difficult to catch your breath and your neck and your head sink into your chest cavity. And the person dies on the cross by suffocation. And the only way to catch your, you are hanging by your hands by the nails on your hands and scholars disagree. Some say it was this, these right there. Some say here, not that it matters, but that's what he's hanging. That's how he's hanging on the cross. He's hanging, the, the nails on his feet are what support him. And so when he wants to push himself up, he has to pull himself up by the nails, push himself up by the nails. So every time he takes a breath, it is incredibly painful. It's hard, he's gasping for breath. Shoulders out of socket, elbows out of socket, organs are failing. Some have probably been ripped open and are just, his, you know, there's basically the skin is the one commentary described it as uh, the word uh, philagrum in the Latin, it moves over to the word fillet. So that, you know, that word of that whipping moves over to the word that is, that we have that is related long Pity, is it epistemology? Anyway, their, their word history, uh, that it means fillet. That's uh, Jesus is fillet. And he hangs there for six hours. Now notice verse 34. This is such a, this is what grabbed me this week. The mixture of wine and gall was offered to Jesus. In the gospel of Mark, Mark says it a little differently. Mark gives a little more detail. Mark says it was wine mixed with myrrh. Okay. Myrrh had two purposes. It was incense, but it was also could be used as a narcotic. This is really fascinating. I want you to understand what Jesus did. And if you mixed it with wine, it could ease the pain. They offered him this wine with myrrh. And what does he say? No thanks. Just think about that. Jesus, we want to help you ease the pain. No. I'm good. There was a custom. Ladies would hang around the crosses and these were kind of angels of mercy. They just had a heart for people. And it's based on Proverbs, really fascinating. Proverbs 31, six through seven. This is what it says. Proverbs 31 is the... Proverbs 31 woman, this has nothing to do with it. This is right before that section. So it has nothing to do with a, a great woman of God. But this is the, the heartbeat of that idea of giving someone on the cross a narcotic. Give strong drink to the one who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Jesus refuses this. Why? I think two reasons. One, Jesus was committed fully to his mission. There would be no shortcuts. His, his calling was to endure the Father's wrath. And he is doing exactly what he's supposed to do. Fully, completely. I don't want to check out. I, want to, I need to experience the Father's wrath. And then there's another reason we'll get to in just one moment, but in verse 35, there's another prophecy being fulfilled. Psalm 22, 18, they divide my garments among them and my clothing, they cast lots. And so you see all these prophecies being fulfilled and you get the idea for me as I was just thinking about this and praying about this week is that, man, these religious leaders would know these prophecies. They would know Isaiah, they would know Psalm. They are seeing the prophecies being fulfilled right in front of their eyes. It is like Jesus saying, guys, get a clue. Don't you see it? And I think that speaks to Jesus's love for these men that wanted Jesus dead. He's, 
showing them prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. It is being fulfilled in front of your eyes. What more do I have to do? Verse 38. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you would... You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And so also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. And I think verse 38 tells us the other reason why Jesus passed on the narcotic. There were two thieves, one on his right, one on his left. They offer him the narcotic. Jesus wanted to have his full senses because he still had ministry to do. There was a robber, a thief that needed to be saved. And he needed his full wits in his humanity fully human, fully divine, about him to minister to that one robber who would turn to him and say, remember me when you get into paradise. He was still reaching out to people and Jesus had to have his full senses, that one last person to save before his death. And it's worth noting in verse 42, just very quickly, Jesus could have saved himself. Well, in the moment in the garden when um, They arrest him and Peter grabs a sword and lobs off the ear of a guy. His name is Malchus. And uh, Jesus says, stop. This is not what I'm about. And he said, if I want to, Peter, I can call a legion of angels if I wanted. And a legion is, or 12 legions, I should say, and a legion is 6,000 soldiers. So what Jesus is saying, Peter, I can call 72,000 angels if I want. Okay, you don't, one sword lobbing off one person's ear, <laughs> that's not going to do it. If I wanted this done, you know, if I want to deal with these guys, I can call down 72,000 angels. And so Jesus could have saved himself, but he doesn't. And he doesn't save himself because he loves who? You loves you he loves you so much and he was willing to go through all of that for you his whole purpose was to live for you and to die for you and defeat death for you as we'll talk about next week and there are many people and maybe some in this room who say like these guys were saying if you would just then we'll believe just come down off the cross and we'll believe if Jesus, you'll do this, I'll believe. Just heal my family, I'll believe. Heal my marriage, we'll believe. Get me a better job, I'll believe. God, just give me a bit more money, I'll believe. And let me submit to you that he's done enough, he's performed enough miracles already. Uh, these are chief priests that had heard about Lazarus. They had heard the testimonies. Some of them certainly heard about Jesus reattaching a guy's ear and they chose not to believe. And so if you're looking for Jesus to prove himself to you, Stop looking. He's already done it. Stop looking and start believing. That's my counsel. Then lastly, it says this in verse uh, 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. That's be about 3 p.m. Uh, and we do the five o'clock service on Friday because that's about the time he was buried. That's, so we, uh, that's the that's sunset. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, labak sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling for Elijah. And one of them once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, wait, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now I want you to notice verse 46 in the final few moments we have. And I think this is the worst moment of all for Jesus, where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I would tell you, theologians debate this. Did God really forsake Jesus? Did he turn his back on Jesus? Or, or, or did Jesus just feel that? There's a debate on that. Because some say God would never, God, you know, he, he can't look on sin but he looks upon us and he loves us you know so and I don't think it really matters whatever camp you want to fall in I'm I I have my own opinion I don't really think it matters 
But at minimum, Jesus felt abandoned. At minimum, this is probably the moment of moments for him. He wasn't, um, he experienced life away from God. And I personally believe that it's verse 46 where Jesus gets a taste of hell. What is hell? Hell is separation from God for eternity. And for a moment in verse 46, Jesus was away from God. And you think about it, he had not been with God for just three years. That's the length of his ministry on earth. He had not been with God just for 30 years. That's the time of 33 years. He had been with God for eternity, for eternity. He was with God at the, he was with God at the beginning and now he's away from his father. Um, and then we conclude with verse 51. Jesus dies and it says this, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now let me just, so let me just walk you through this because I think this will help you. And this is what we talked about in children's worship. We actually ripped a curtain today, a piece of material. So ask your kids about. So in the Holy of Holies, in the temple was this very special room. It was called the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, that Ark. That, um, what's the actor's name? Indiana Jones. I don't think that's the actor, but that's, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, Harrison Ford, right? He rescues it or whatever, however that ends. I don't understand that ending. But anyway, that Ark of the Covenant, okay, was in the Holy of Holies. And it's this perfectly cubed room and no one could go in the Holy of Holies. No one. No, no, cannot, no, 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 Kendall, no, 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 Corey, no, Bill. No one could go in there because it was the place where God was. And if you went in there, you were dead meat. Except one day a year, the high priest went through all these rituals, bathing and clothing he would wear. He would get blood from a sacrificed animal. He would have incense and he would go through a curtain and into the Holy of Holies. And the incense was there so that the priest could not get a clear view of God and be struck dead. It was to fall, kind of fog his vision. And he would sprinkle the blood on what is called the mercy seat. The mercy seat is basically the lid on the Ark of the Covenant. And then they would tie a rope around him in case he died. They could pull him out. It's it's really fascinating stuff. And that happened on Yom Kippur. Maybe you hear that in the news. Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Jesus dies and that curtain, that veil, which is 30 feet tall and four inches thick. Four inches thick. Is ripped from top to bottom. Only God could do that. It comes from God ripping. And now that gives you and me access. That's the message God was sending you and me. You and I now have access to God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Paul writes in Hebrews. We have confidence to enter the most holy place. That's the presence of God by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. Jesus' body was symbolically the curtain ripped. And now you and I have access to God. Verse 51, let's continue real quick. The earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. This is after, this is the third day. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Can you say that? 
He was probably there from the, the beatings with the Roman elites to the very end. And he comes to the conclusion, this is the son of God. And how did he know that? I love Billy Graham, as you know, and he is pretty strong on this and it's scriptural. No one, listen to this, no one can come to God. No one can come to God unless God's spirit comes to him and draws him. So go back in time, the day you became a Christian, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You remember that day? Remember that moment, that season? You know, it's different for everyone. It couldn't have happened unless the spirit was drawing you. That's why we can sit in a room and some person can say, man, the spirit, this sermon spoke to me and you know, this is awesome, this is amazing. The other person says, man, that was the worst thing I've ever heard. It's the spirit's working differently. This is what John 6, says. No one can come to God unless God's spirit draws him. That's the genesis of that. So in other words, you can't come to God when you want. You can only come to God when the spirit draws you. That Roman centurion couldn't come to God anytime he wanted. The spirit had to draw him. It's the same, it's the same basically the same thing Peter says when Peter's asked, who do people say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says that was revealed to you by, not by flesh and blood, but by the spirit of God. And he may be drawing you. And if that's today, let this be the day because it may not happen again. Don't be a coward. Don't be embarrassed. I mean, look what Jesus did for you. What more must he do? I'll be down front. And I want, I'd love to talk with you. Just shoot me an email. Let's go do coffee. Grab a lunch. On me. Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Solid, right? And let's talk about it. He loves you so much. So I go back to the original question, talking about that work of art, that starry night. How do you view the cross? Does it mean anything to you? Just, ah, uh, interesting story. I don't need it. Or is it a reminder of what Jesus did? Would you stand for closing prayer? Father, we love you. Um, and your, Jesus, what you did just boggles the mind. It's just, uh, yeah. it's hard to grasp. And but we just are grateful for it. Thank you that we can know God because of your sacrifice, that atoning sacrifice. God, I pray that we would walk humbly because of what you've done. We would walk gently and kind, that we would love each other well, that we would love you well. Father, let us walk with grace and peace. But God, let us also walk with joy knowing that 